Uh, okay, well, uh, Photo Clubbers, welcome and thanks for uh, attending uh, tonight's uh, webinar, uh, the latest in the club series of webinars to kind of keep us going during COVID when we can't meet uh, you know, person to person. So um, Mike and I were talking about this and with vaccinations and you know restrictions lifted, uh, we thought it would be fun to do some webinars on places to go to to take uh, pictures. And uh, I had published an article in PSA Journal last year about Death Valley. And I said, you know, it'd be pretty easy for me to uh, turn this into a PowerPoint deck. So we uh, decided to do this. So tonight's topic is photography in Death Valley National Park. Uh, sorry, guys. There we go. It's frozen for a second. So things I'm going to cover tonight. So why Death Valley National Park, um, Larry White's uh, partner notwithstanding. We'll talk about why it's a great place to go. Uh, I'm gonna go over trip logistics questions and things you need to bring and know to have a nice time while you're in the park. And when to go, an important consideration there. Things to bring. Uh, and then of course, the heart of the presentation, uh, where to shoot. And hopefully I'll give you some helpful tips that uh, you can use uh, if you do decide to go there. Um, so why Death Valley National Park? It's close. You can be there in five hours of driving or even a little less. So it's not, uh, uh, and you know, it's not a flying destination. So it's, uh, it's a pretty easy spot to get to. It's big. It is the largest park in the lower 48 states. So there's lots of things to go take pictures of and places to go and see inside the park. So if it takes you two thirds of a day to get there, you can easily spend three days getting around to different sites and either sightseeing or taking pictures. Um, there are, it's kind of reasonably logistic friendly. There are three choices inside the park for overnight stays, uh, plus camping and then one choice in Beatty, Nevada for uh, also that leaves you reasonably close to the park. So unlike some of the national parks that don't have much lodging, uh, this one gets good marks for uh, places to stay. And of course, it's beautiful. Uh, you know, it's lots of great um, outdoor uh, shooting there. So that's why we like uh, Death Valley National Park. Um, trip logistics things, um, there are, three places in the park to, in, actually inside the park. They are all run by park concessionaires, which, you know, I, I'm not saying it should be any different, but they, they at least the inn and the stovepipe wells place, service is not always ideal at these places. And I have this fantasy when I've had some, particularly at stovepipe wells, or some problematic service that if only there was a Comfort Inn and a Hampton Inn across the street, the people running the place would pick up the pace a little bit. But that said, they're all um, you know reasonably nice places, and you know maybe you'll have better luck than I've had with some of the uh, folks who work at those places. Um, the ranch, so Stovepipe Wells. I don't know who the actual concessionaire is, but the uh, inn at Furnace Creek and the ranch at Furnace Creek are very close to each other and they're run by the same concessionaire. Now you'll ask me which one and it's either Delaware North or Zantara. I think it's Zantara. Um, anyone can correct me if they actually know the answer to that. But the ranch at Furnace Creek is very high end. It's very expensive and, you know, it's kind of billed as a, uh, I mean, they're a market niche is sort of uh, luxury lodging in a remote national park. So I, I went in there once and had dessert uh, for lunch. Other than that, I've never been in there. And I've been at both the inn at St Furnace Creek and Still Flat Wells, and you know, they're both uh, nice places. The inn at Furnace Creek was recently fully remodeled. They uh, tore down the main buildings where the lunchroom was and rebuilt them. And then a lot of the rooms were also rebuilt. So that's been significantly modernized in the last few years. So three places in the park. Um, also, you could realistically stay in Beanie, Nevada and on the east side of the park. And there is a couple of uh, motel chains in Beanie that- Hey, uh, Pete, I gotta, I gotta say something. It's Beatty. Yeah. 
Yeah, please, yeah. It's Beatty, Nevada. Okay, sue me. <laughs> yeah. Did I spell it wrong too? or just No, this? that's spelled right. It's pronounced Beatty though. Okay, fair enough. Um, and uh, anyway, that is, uh, you know, it's a small town and it has uh, some eating options and uh, a couple of uh, motels in there. And it is not... It's not as well located as the first three, but uh, it's reasonable. Uh, you can always camp, uh, and uh, there's uh, two different campgrounds in the park. And all the look, all of them have sort of location trade. At least the three that are in the park, they have location trade-offs, but they're not huge. So if you wanted to be really close to the Mesquite Sand Dunes, which is the uh, the sand dunes set in the center of the park. You'd want to be at Stovepipe Wells. You wanted to be really close to Zabriskie Point or the Badwater Basin. You'd want to be at Furnace Creek. But again, um, they're all, they're within about a thirty minute drive or less of each other. So I think it's um, you know you kind of flip a coin on what are the best places. Okay, trip logistics. Uh, there's a lot of driving. It's a huge park, so be prepared for that. There's two places to get gas. It's very expensive, so try and go into the park with at least a full tank of gas, and maybe you won't have to fuel again. There's Can I interrupt two... there, Pete? Yeah, of course. No, no diesel, by the way. Oh, thanks, Steve. Okay. So, uh, no diesel. And I don't know about uh, EV charging stations, so maybe they are uh, building those out. Um, two uh, grocery stores, one at Furnace Creek and one at Stovepipe Wells. Um, and just as a comment, um, there's three terrific shooting locations, the Eureka, Ibex Sand Dunes, and the Racetrack. They're at the extreme north and south parts of the park. And uh, to reach them, you need um, high clearance. Even though I have occasionally, I've been to all three of these, I have occasionally seen passenger cars there, but figure you need a high clearance vehicle with, in particular, with good tires. All three of these locations are notorious for blown tires. And uh, if you can't change them, uh, you're probably down uh, at least $1,000 for a tow to get out of there. And you might even get to spend an extra night because they don't, they don't all necessarily get a visitor every day. So uh, I, I would urge, uh, you know, it's not dangerous really, but I would urge reasonable caution if you want to go visit these places. And we'll talk about you know why you would want to go visit them a little bit later on. Pete, are you talking something more rugged than an SUV? No, no, an SUV would be fine. You know, the biggest thing, Carl, it's not like you don't need four-wheel drive, and you could probably do these even without high clearance, but the risk of the blown tires is quite significant. Uh, yeah, so I, I would say more than anything, you know, don't go there with a set of tires with 50,000 miles on them. There you go. And, and even when you're there, uh, you know, drive, you can't avoid the rocks in the road. So drive slowly. And if you drive slowly, you're not gonna blow tires. Um, and in case you're wondering why I emphasize this so much, because uh, I personally blew a tire out at the racetrack and uh, it was in a rental car and I barely got it changed because it was hard to understand exactly how on that particular vehicle, um, you were supposed to change the tires. So um, it's, it's a big issue. OK, so when to go. Uh, so you know, unless you're a glutton for punishment, uh, probably not in the summer. The uh, little picture I put up there is a shot of my uh, uh, inside thermometer on my car. And that is about 6.30 at night mm. on a day in June. So, and it can get, you know, it's, it can get to 120 or occasionally over that uh, in the park during the summer. So the heat is a problem in the, in the summer. Um, winter can be terrific. It, it can be cold. And particularly up at the racetrack where it's a little higher elevation as an example, it can really get cold there. Um, if you get lucky, uh, there can be standing water in the bad water basin which can make for some tremendous photographs. So winter is a reasonable choice. Uh, spring, uh, you not, probably not this year, but occasionally they do get a lot of rain there and um, you can get some flowers into your pictures. Uh, it's also good for a little bit later in the spring, it's good for night skies and 
the night skies are good into the early fall. And spring and the fall, the one downside, particularly in the spring, particularly if the word is out that it's a good wildflower season, the park's going to get really crowded. And you know you will need to make lodging reservations uh, in advance or you won't be able to get them. So those are some of the trade-offs about um, the different uh, times. I I've been there and other than this one picture that I took in June, I, I don't think I've been there in the summer, but I've been there in all three of the other seasons. And, uh, you know, they're all nice, just different uh, trade-offs and advantages and disadvantages. Um, but if you see, for example, you know, next fall, we start to get a lot of rain and you think you want to go there, I would get reservations early because the hotels will uh, start to fill up. Okay, things to bring. Um, so your normal camera stuff uh, for this group, I don't really need to go into that. Um, an ultra wide angle zoom can be helpful for some cool shots, uh, particularly on the sand dunes. And you know, maybe like on the racetrack, get down low and get right into one of those rocks. So uh, if you have one, um, that would be nice. You know, but yeah, a typical zoom length is uh, 24, 105 or 24, 120. And it's probably a lens like that would be all you would really have to have. So don't need to bring a lot of elaborate uh, camera things, one or two lenses and you're good. Um, if you wanna take night photos, you would wanna bring a, uh, a lens with a big aperture. Uh, I would always carry, particularly if you're there in the warmer weather or going to one of the more remote spots, uh, I would bring water and some extra clothing or blankets or something just in case uh, you um, have the unhappy experience of spending uh, an extra night out in the park, but particularly the water if it's at all warm. Uh, and then in the winter, uh, you, you will need, it'll get surprisingly cold, so you'll need some cold weather clothing. Um, and um, uh, remote locations, if you have them, or have access to them, a satellite transmitter is not the worst idea in the world. Um, I have one, so if people want to borrow it sometime, well, that, that'd be fine because it sits in my drawer in the garage most of the time, but um, they uh, can uh, be a lifesaver in certain circumstances. So uh, getting to the heart of the presentation, places to shoot. So very I'm going to summarize first, and then we'll drill down and look at um, uh, specific locations and pictures. Um, various sand dunes. Uh, there's three major sets in the park that we'll talk about. The ghost town in Rhyolite is actually outside of the park. It's on the east side, not far from, um, I'll let Mike uh, McCartney pronounce it again, but that town in uh, Nevada, it begins with a B. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, Rhyolite is near Beatty, and we'll talk about that. Uh, the Devil's Golf Course is uh, a little bit north of the Badwater Basin, but a uh, very interesting shooting spot. Scotty's Castle is still closed, and it was supposed to open this year once. And I haven't looked it up, but uh, I would imagine COVID has uh, been a setback for that. Uh, Scotty's Castle was basically flooded with mud in a freak rainstorm in October of um, thinking, I don't know when, I mean, a long time ago, about five years ago. And the, the repairs were so ext extensive, it still hasn't been uh, rebuilt. I mean, by the way, Scotty's Castle is, uh, there's an interesting backstory about it, but it's a group of uh, buildings in the far north end of the park that were built as uh, sort of a semi-scam by uh, somebody named Scotty. Uh, the racetrack uh, we'll talk about, and uh, there's various rulings that can make nice uh, uh, either main subjects or highlight items for your pictures. Uh, Zabriskie Point is like the classic shot in the park, and uh, it's near um, um, the inn and the ranch at Furnace Creek, so that'll, that'll get pretty busy. Badwater Basin, again, is uh, on the, more on the east side of the park. Um, so I um, found this map, which is, has a few things missing in it that uh, I'm going to explain in a minute. Um, can everybody see my uh, cursor? Just 
Somebody nod your head up here by the. Yeah, okay, I see someone nodding their head. Perfect. So this map uh, it just had nice colors and it was a nice graphic. So I thought I would use it, but I will point out that up here in the upper left where this red arrow is, it is not including, I think it was made a long time ago and it, uh, the park was significantly expanded to um, uh, locations up in this area. So the green of the park would extend uh, to the left and then uh, to the top of the screen to scoop up uh, everything. But I'll be using, I'll, I'll be reproducing this map as we uh, go through and talk about the specific locations. Um, but point out a few things. So uh, getting to the park, um, to, to Lone Pine, this is the most common way you would drive there from 395. Uh, and drive to a little bit south of Lone Pine. And then from there, it's about a, uh, to get to uh, Stovepipe Wells, it's about an hour and 15 minutes. So coming from 395. And uh, you can reach the park um, via this road uh, down at the bottom from uh, Ridgecrest and then Trona. Uh, that's not so commonly used. And then you can also reach the park from down here in the far, uh, right bottom corner from uh, I-10, excuse me, I-15. Uh, you would drive to uh, Baker on I-15 and then go north on uh, Route uh, 127. So uh, from where we live, uh, there's three basic ways to get to the park, but most likely you're going to come in on Route 190 from uh, Lone Pine. The um, Lodging places I talked about are in the white circles. So Stovepipe Wells Village right here and the Furnace Creek complex is over here. So uh, I think those are the, and uh, there's the uh, rhyolite and the sites on the east side of the park are up here. So uh, I think I'll move on, but those are kind of just to get everybody oriented on this, on Death Valley uh, geographically. Um, so places to shoot, various sand dunes. The, actually, let me go back. Um, I'm gonna point these out because this is my map for the sand dunes. So the Mesquite sand dunes are right here in the center of the park, um, right across from Stovepipe Wells Village. The Eureka sand dunes are up here in the new parts of the park off this map. And then way down here in the far, southeast corner are the Ibex sandwich. So those are the, the geographic locations of the three major sand dune fields. So uh, the steep sand dunes, um, uh, so th thereby they, they probably get 95% or 99% of, of the park visitors who ever see sand dunes because they're right in the middle of the park and there's a great big parking area, easy to walk out there. They are a morning photograph. Uh, however, um, they have two significant drawbacks for photographic purposes. The first is, unless you're fortunate enough to be there the day after a big windstorm, they are photographically, they're completely trashed with the footprints. So that really is quite a problem. Um, so I think I saw Lily Chang on the phone call. I'll just mention that email you sent me the other day about Michael Fry's uh, shots. Um, uh, you know, they, they were terrific, but um, again, he must have done those the, a couple of hours after a huge sandstorm because it's very difficult to find those dunes without footprints exactly where you would like to have a nice picture. So that is a big disadvantage of those, of those dunes. They're also relatively short, which I think can make them somewhat of a struggle as a uh, composition. So those are the steep sand dunes. Again, the good news is they're easy to get to. They are primarily considered a morning shot. So the Eureka sand dunes uh, are an evening shot and they are located um, uh, on the west northwest side of the park. And they have the distinction of being the second highest set of sand dunes in North America. The high point on them is over 700 feet high. 
Um, to get there, you would normally not go there, although you can, but you would normally not go there from the park itself. You would uh, drive on 395 to uh, Big Pine. And from Big Pine, um, you would take um, a pretty good paved road about 35 miles west. And then you turn off and drive down the Eureka Valley on a, on a I think it's nine miles. And sometimes that road has been graded and it's not too awful. But other times it's got a lot of washboarding and rocks and you, know, you just have to drive slowly and just be patient about it. So uh, it's flat and you know there's not big potholes. So again, you could probably get down there in a passenger car, but it, it will be a big pain and uh, you do have to be careful about blowing out tires. Um, I would also comment uh, there are either spectacular sand dunes, you know, great photo ops, but many of the good compositions require long climbs through the sand because they're big and it doesn't, there's not lots of shots down at the base. You really have to go higher up on them to get to places where you can get sensible compositions. So that is something you would need to be prepared to do if you want to go out there. Um, they are a great spot for nighttime photography because there is as close to zero light pollution as uh, any place I've ever been to. So they're very dark. Um, the key things about the Eureka Sand, the key thing about the Eureka Sand Dunes in terms Any of- question? Yes, please, fire. The, um, the night shots, do you do them up high or do you do them down low? You know, probably down low. Okay. Uh, I mean, you know, whatever floats your boat, right? But right, uh, exactly. I, think, I think most of the shots try and you know, capture the Milky Way arching over the sand dunes. There you go. Um, so let me think, where was it? Okay, so the Eureka Sand Dunes, they are in a long valley that runs north-south. They're at the far south end. And on the east side, there are high cliff walls and they kind of continue around to the south and southwest sides. And the only area where the valley is really open is off to the north and northwest. So by far the best light is in the evenings and near the summer solstice. So May through August is going to be your best bet. Um, the other times of the year, I mean, you, you'll get decent pictures, but you won't get that late long light, you know, you know, crusting over the ripples, creating all the high contrast ripple shots because the sun just goes down behind uh, cliffs and mountains before uh, it, you really get good light. So, or good low light. So this is pretty much of, um, you know, like I say, May, June, uh, July, again, it's getting warm by then, but uh, say May and June, uh, that is your, by far your best time to shoot at Rita. Uh The Ibex dunes are uh, the least visited dunes in the park. Um, unfortunately, um, they do seem to be being discovered a little more. When I first started going to them, um, which is probably, Maybe three years ago, I, hardly anybody knew about them. I had been to Death Valley a number of times and never heard about them. So they uh, are, you know, they're, they're very isolated and a lot of people don't know about them. So that is a big advantage because uh, Ibex and Eureka, you won't be dealing with the dreaded footprints. Um, Ibex sand dunes are pretty much 100% an even shot because like Eureka, there are some low mountains or cliffs off to the east and they, they don't get early morning light, but they get tremendous light uh, October through March uh, when the sun is uh, setting um, southwest, excuse me, south, yeah, southwest and west. So uh, that makes, and that's really the time you wanna shoot them in the afternoons. Uh, in my opinion of the three sets of sand dunes, they are by far the best. They get great light during the right time of the year, uh, low traffic, and maybe most importantly, they're sort of medium height. The Mesquite dunes are low, the, Mar the Eureka dunes are high. I Ibex dunes mm -hmm. seem to be, to my eye, just about right for making interesting compositions. And they're also large. So there's four, three or four, depending on how you count them, sets of um, dunes within the complex. 
So you have lots of choices for where you want to take your pictures and um, uh, and lots of good possibilities of compositions. Getting to them is, again, they're in the far south part of the park. So if you're just going to shoot the Ibex dunes, you would probably drive to Baker on I-15. And then you drive 30 minutes north on Route 127, and then about another 30 minutes on uh, uh, dirt roads. And these, within my experience anyway, usually these are pretty well graded. So it's not so alarming like it is on the Eureka Dunes or some other places. And uh, again, just drive slow. And there is a water crossing that most of the time has water in it. And uh, so that would be an argument about having a higher clearance vehicle there. But for those of you who've done this before, you know, just get to the edge of the water, you know, hold your breath and gun it and you'll shoot right across. And then be sure to slow your car down right away once you clear the water so you don't hit a rock and blow a tire as you come out. But uh, it's not really much of a problem to get across it, but I, I probably wouldn't do this in a Prius if uh, there was water in there. Um, in addition, Unlike the other two sets of sand dunes, you have to walk to get to these. The, the, there's a road that goes on the west side of them, but it is about a mile and a quarter away from the dunes, and you, you're not allowed to drive your vehicle there across the uh, desert. So uh, you, you got to walk uh, a mile and a quarter, and you got to walk a mile and a quarter back, and you know, you'll be carrying um, uh, photo equipment and on the way back, you'll probably be in pretty dark conditions. So, you know, th this should be done by people in, you know, reasonable physical condition who can handle this kind of a thing. And, you know, if you're not comfortable with navigating back to your car after dark, uh, you know, get somebody to do that with you who uh, wouldn't. And I was out there with uh, Suzanne Tanaka about, um, I don't know, two months ago. And I would only admit this to my closest friends, but we knew we were going to find our, we, we shot nighttime photos, so it was pitch dark when we came back. And we knew we were going to find our car sooner or later, but uh, I will just say it was later before we actually located the car. So uh, you do need to be a little bit cautious about that walk back in the dark. So any questions about the, the sand dunes before I move on? Okay, super. Um, so, uh, Pete yes. Lily, I do have a question. Yeah, I find, uh, yeah, okay, I find it on mute. Yes, okay. For the um, Eureka uh, uh, Zoom, mm -hmm. when you drive, uh, can you, is your SUV uh, work or need a bigger, high, bigger um, SUV? It's like, oh, no, I mean, a, a, a passenger SUV will take care of everything just fine. Uh, you know, you're, you're not going to be, it's, the road is dead flat. It's not really that pothole, but it's just, uh, it can be very washboarded and there's lots of uh, alarming rocks so that all look like tire destroying rocks. So you just got to go out there and drive slowly. Almost as, um, as bad as a, a racetrack in yeah. terms of the tire damage. Well, let me, we'll talk about the racetrack. Oh, okay. I would say uh -huh. your risks on the racetrack are higher, not because the road is necessarily in worse condition, but instead of nine miles, you're driving 26 miles on times two, because you got to come back. Uh, so uh, statistically, uh, I would say just because of the longer exposure, your odds of uh, blowing out a tire at the racetrack are much higher. What, one more question for the oh. I. Ibex uh, hiking, 1.25 miles. Mm -hmm. Are those uh, walk or hike on the sand or, or more solid footing? Oh, no, it's, it's dead flat. No, that, there is a very slight uphill going toward the dunes, but it's completely flat. And, um, you know, there's no trail, but the terrain is pretty good. So, you know, again, uh, you'll be in sand sometimes, and sometimes it'll be a harder, the surface will be more packed down. Uh, but um, anybody who's a reasonably fit hiker can do this. Okay. Yeah, one more. Because yep. <laughs> I'm so interested in this. When you well, say evening, it means like a sunset, right? Sunset, yeah, sorry. Okay, yeah. thanks. Okay. 
Uh, okay, so let me see uh, what I'm doing next. Uh, okay, so pictures. Um, uh, I think you know, I think I already pointed out where these sand dunes are. So this is the Eureka sand dunes, and I have climbed. The high point is not visible in this. It's off to the left. I have climbed. Uh, I don't know. I've probably a gain of 200 out of a possible 700. And um, so again, to get to a spot where I could uh, get some ripples in the foreground uh, and see the rest of the dune. And this was shot in, I don't know, I think probably uh, it was in the spring, I think. So this is the Eureka sand dunes. Uh, this is, I have a couple of the Ibex sand dunes. This is one of the uh, dunes out there. I think this is the first time I went there. Now, this is the Ibex sand dunes again. Uh, I had a, a 10X uh, ND on this and got that nice dreamy look in the sky. And this is the Mesquite sand dunes. And uh, I can assure you, this was the morning after a huge windstorm. And if you look closely on this, you can see that um, somebody has uh, already um, uh, put a set of footprints up to the ridge line, and this this guy is going up there again. And I think uh, this was shot in 2015, so I, I have to say my memories are a little dim. But I think there were one or two spots where I had to uh, content aware fill out the uh, out footprints. But I, I just again, as a caution about the the mesquite sand dunes, this is very unusual. You know, most of the time they're completely trashed with uh, footprints. This, by the way, was on a club field trip there. We went there in October of uh, 2015 and had a nice uh, couple of days there. And this is the Mesquite sand dunes shot from the south on the other side of Route uh, 178. And I walked up um, I don't know, a quarter of a mile just to get a little elevation and did the uh, sort of panorama look at the uh, panoramic look at the, uh, the uh, Mesquite sand dunes. Uh, again, this is a morning shot. So the Rhyolite ghost town, um, I don't have too much to, oh, I did have some things to say. So I go there at night, you know, maybe it's a morning shot, but on the west side, uh, the there's mountains that would block uh, any kind of late light there. I've never been there in the morning, so I wouldn't be completely sure. Um, people still live there. so. There's a bunch of old buildings. Uh, some are grouped together and some are isolated. But probably you would have more fun there doing some nighttime shooting uh, than uh, uh, trying to do this during uh, good lighting, good good lighting conditions. So that's my recommendation about Rhyolite. It's uh, pretty easy to get to if you're in the center of the park and you just drive um, east uh, toward uh, Nevada, and there's a turnout to it. And again, this is not part of the park. This is uh, outside of park boundaries. Um, so interesting, doesn't get good uh, morning or evening light. And uh, again, rhyolite is, if you can see my cursor, I'm pointing to it with this red arrow right there. So we're somewhat out of the, you drive up uh, this road into uh, Nevada and somewhat outside of the park boundaries. So uh, rhyolite pictures, I think I just have this nighttime picture. So this was also shot on the club's um, uh, 2015 field trip there. This is in, uh, again, October. And so I'm looking more or less west here. And the, the Milky Way is rotated around uh, by that time of year to that part of the sky. Um, the lighting on the side of the building is coming from the people who live there. There are some, they had some outdoor lights on their house and they were just enough to light up that wall. And then uh, somebody, I think we'll give Suzanne Tanaka this credit again, took a lantern and threw a cloth over it and put it inside the building to get the uh, sort of rim lighting around the uh, windows and doors. Um, anyway, this is the old bank building in Rhyolite uh, under the Milky Way. Um, so any questions about Rhyolite? Okay, the racetrack. Um, so the racetrack- Wait, wait, wait. I'm yeah, fire away. So is the bank building the only thing we shoot in Royal Light? Well, the, Steve, the, the other buildings, the bank building is nice because it looks kind of cool and it's all by itself. There are other buildings there and I don't remember spending, we did sightseeing there. So we walked through them and they were kind of cool and interesting. My memory, and this is five and a half years ago now, 
was that they would have been difficult photo compositions because um, um, uh, they were there was too much stuff there. There was no way to isolate things. Now, I, I don't like to talk about street photography, but the street photographers might find some more interesting things inside the uh, buildings. Uh, but again, I don't like to talk about street photography. So we're, uh, we're gonna move on. Um, other questions about Rylite? Um, so the racetrack, uh, let's see. Uh, this is really hard to get to. It's all inside the park. You would um, drive there. Uh, actually, let me go to my map. Uh, so blown tires, I've emphasized that enough, but it's a really cool spot. So, you know, this is like a bucket list item. If you can figure out how to uh, sensibly and safely get there, uh, you should try it sometime. Um, it is best on a winter afternoon. The, it's not a good morning shot because once again, there are high mountains to the east. And so your, your good light would be, good light would be over by the time the sun clears the mountains. But there is sort of an opening in the valley to the south. So when uh, the sun is setting, particularly when it's setting, but uh, I'm not sure if in the morning it would be good, but definitely when it's setting, you will get great light, great low light coming into the uh, uh, racetrack playa, and you can really get some uh, cool pictures. So uh, location, um, you would, uh, again, I'm assuming everybody can see my little arrow. So you would leave here and you would follow the signs to Scotty's Castle, swing around here like this. And um, this will take about an hour maybe. And then your paved road ends and you have um, uh, 26 miles of dirt road that is sometimes in good condition and sometimes <laughs> in terrible condition. So uh, this is um, uh, you know, this is not a casual spot to go visit because people do have car breakdowns or blown tires and wind up spending uh, a lot more time out there than uh, they would think they would. Um, one suggestion for you is uh, there is in Furnace Creek, there is a business that rents Jeeps. And last time I priced these, I've never done it, uh, but um, uh, I think they were running about $200 for a day. And, you know, if you can pool up with some friends and split the cost, uh, you can take one of their uh, Jeeps out there and that would probably uh, keep you uh, safer and you know, less likely to get stranded out there. Um, so other things to mention, um, uh, Let's see, for the hikers, uh, there is uh, on the north end of the playa, there's a trail up to the top of Yubihibi Peak. And from Yubihibi Peak, uh, you have fabulous views of the racetrack and can see all the way to the uh, eastern Sierra Crest, uh, at least on a clear day. So if you leave yourself maybe three extra hours, uh, get out there in the late morning, that uh, is a, another uh, fun thing you can do while you're out there. So uh, pictures, uh, so this is like the classic moving rock picture. Um, so I see Mike Sugar, is it Mike, wave. Mike Sugar, wave to everybody because Mike uh, and I went out there together in um, 2011, I think, in January. There was another club field trip. Uh, he and I went out there and uh, that's what he was, we were standing right next to each other when I took this picture. So again, uh, this is this was in January, and the sun is coming, and I'm looking kind of southeast here. Sun is coming in off to my right and sort of the, to the upper uh, right side of the picture. And you know, for uh, for about two minutes, you uh, you get fabulous uh, golden hour kinds of light with um, the the tracks in the rocks, so um, the nice contrasty. Uh, trails. So um, what else to mention here? Uh, so there's a lot of these. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yes. I thought that some kids drove their cars all over racetrack and really spoiled it. Is that true? They, they did. But, you know, mercifully, um, nature takes care of these things. And, um, you know, the next big rainstorm, this thing turns, turns to a sea of mud. Okay. And, um, you know, the state apparently uh, went away. But yeah, it is unfortunate. It, it is very unfortunate. Occasionally there is uh, 
you know, vandalism in the park. You know, there is some video of, uh, on Facebook, or you, I think actually these guys put it on Facebook and then got arrested, where they drove uh, their car out onto the Badwater Basin. And so it, it's unfortunate that these things happen, but as far as I know, the uh, it, it's recovered. So somebody else had a question? No, okay. Oh. Pete, a question for taking this kind of photo, you, you, how wide angle lens you use? Like uh, I don't know, Lily. Um, uh -huh. uh, probably a 24 millimeter. You know, if you ever do this, the main advice I'll, I'll give you is 95% you know, of the pictures are people shooting at shoulder height. And mm -hmm. it's just a much weaker picture. So I had all the legs on my tripod collapse. I was sitting. And so I'm down nice and low, and you get this, you know, much more dramatic look, I think, of the trail of the rock. Mm -hmm. So if you ever, like I say, if you ever go there, don't don't shoot these things standing up. You know, you really need to get low for a effective composition. And and then people are allowed to walk on this um yeah. the clay. Yeah, as long as it's not wet. You know, oh. you, you wouldn't want to go out there if it was wet anyway. Make a foot. Yeah, when it's dry, it's a pretty firm surface. Uh, I, I, you wouldn't really know that anybody had ever walked on it. Thanks. Okay. Uh, and then uh, I, I camped there once and uh, shot a nighttime shot. So we, uh, this is a composite. Um, we, uh, my wife was with me and we waited until it got dark and we made a few notes on where to go. And the moon was coming up uh, about two hours after darkness. So we went out there and uh, eventually found this rock. This is another case where I just remember thinking, there won't be any problem to find a rock. And, uh, you know, we had flashlights and looked and looked and looked and we finally found this rock. Uh, and um, just set up and shot the rock and then um, uh, waited until, with the Milky Way in the background, and then waited until the moon rose and made a second exposure and then blended the, uh, the ground and the sky in a, in a picture. And that's the only way you can really get illumination on uh, an area that's blood. So, uh, can yeah. I interject something? Yeah. Unless you know something different, when time I went there, all the rocks are in the far end of the playa. You yeah, no, that, that's it. Yeah, when, when you arrive, so you're, you go back to my map, you'll be driving south. The playa is uh, a couple miles long, running north south, and, and you'll be there. Oh my God, where are the rocks? And uh, the rocks are all at the south end. And the, the reason for this, as far as I know, is um, it's finally the, the theory that aliens from Area 51 were moving them around is finally disproven. But uh, the rocks, uh, if you can see my cursor again, it's believed the rocks come off of this cliff, uh, fall onto the playa. And um, um, I think this is actually film. Some scientists went out there and did this. It, 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 this it is four, say again. It was filmed. You can see it. Yeah, this is four thousand feet, so it gets cold there. And in the winter, during the storm, it gets very muddy and slushy, and, and you get high winds. And it's slippery enough that the wind can uh, blow the rocks through the uh, through the you know now very wet and slippery playa. So, but this cliff is only at the south end, so. Steve is quite right that uh, don't be crushed when you first get there and say, where are those gosh darn rocks? Oh, uh, so, it was more insidious than that. You, it's, it's, they, get, they move when there's a thin film of ice on the lake and the back pressure of the ice pushing, uh, the wind pushing on the ice, actually the summation pushes it against the rock and pushes the rock a lot. <laughs> okay. Um, so, any more about the racetrack? Yeah, uh, hey Pete, that uh, the Milky Way is straight up, so probably the time is like uh, was like October or something. Yeah, exactly, Lily. This is shot in uh, mid October. And you just camp out there, and then so there's a campground there. Yeah, there's a camp. There's a campground a little bit south of it. So. My uh, my long suffering wife said she was up for an adventure, so you know we just packed up uh, tents and uh, camping equipment and went out there. And this this by the way was a trip where I got the blown tire on the way back. Um, mm -hmm. So um, uh, she she gave me moral support while I was trying to figure out how to change the tire and 
get the uh, lug nuts off the car. So uh, any other racetrack questions? It's a lovely. Uh, oh, thanks, Lee. Uh, okay, so various ruins. Um, there are various ruins around uh, Death Valley. Uh, Rhyolite, which we saw pictures of. Um, there's a, the best set of mining, for mining ruins that I know of anyway, is behind the Ibex Dune. So you would tack on about, uh, you know, maybe another quarter or half a mile, and uh, you would come across uh, those ruins back there. But they're pretty well preserved, and like I say, they're the best ones I know about. Uh, near Furnace Creek, uh, there's sort of some exhibits about some, you know, old steam engines and equipment uh, that um, you can probably make a reasonable shot of uh, either at night or at different times of the day. Uh, the Keen Wonder Mine um, uh, was closed for years and years and years, and then it got reopened. And I went back there um, a few years back, and uh, I think again, to my people smarter than me about this could maybe figure out some pictures. But to my eye, it was more of a um, uh, you know, it was more of a sightseeing thing, sightseeing, sightseeing thing than a picture. But Keen Wonder Mine is another set of uh, ruins there. So these are some ruins that can make uh, possible uh, uh, either subjects or accent points for uh, pictures. So these are the mining ruins behind uh, the Ibex sand dunes, uh, shot, uh, shot at nighttime in the, uh, in the spring. So, and you can see that uh, it's, you know, they're pretty cool. I mean, this is a nice structure with a lot of uh, detail and uh, things uh, to uh, catch your interest in, in a picture. Okay, Devil's Golf Course. So these are, so we're moving to some of the more classic sites in Death Valley. Uh, Devil's Golf Course is, uh, my main comment here is be careful. These things are like razors and uh, you don't want to, they're, they're about you know, higher than your ankle, lower than your knee, easy to stumble on them and you, you don't want to do that. So be careful when you're walking uh, among these, uh, their salt structures. Uh, probably morning or evening is fine on these things. And uh, Devil's Golf Course is, this whole area is a bad water basin. Devil's Golf Course is right here. So they're about 30 minutes from the, uh, the hotels and motels in Furnace Creek. And let's see, this is in the winter in the morning. And these uh, these structures here are what make up the uh, Devil's Golf Course. And uh, for you hikers and mountain climbers, that's a telescope peak in the background. And so, you know, I, I got lucky and had a, a nice sky at that particular morning. So this is Devil's Golf Course. Uh, Zabriskie Point is like, if there's a classic shot in the park, it's probably Zabriskie Point. And it's, I would say it's mostly a morning shot. I don't think it's, People are getting great images there in the afternoon. And, uh, or it can be a nice nighttime shot. It's very close to Furnace Creek, so that's nice about it. Uh, you don't have to get up at a crazy hour to drive drive for 45 minutes to get there. Uh, and again, uh, Zabriskie Point is right here. So again, it's probably a 15 minute drive from Furnace Creek. Nice parking lot. Short walk to get up to the uh, photo spots. So this is a, it's basically a set of uh, badlands, some of them colorful and some of them more monochromatic. Uh, this is a close up of uh, one of them uh, in the morning. And this again was shot on the, I think the 2015 uh, club field trip. Uh, and then this is, uh, actually I'm aimed in almost the same direction, just a larger panoramic shot. And uh, this is shot at uh, nighttime under a, very, a very a moon almost set, very low moon. So you can see the Badlands and then I, I'm not in the picture. I, I, I didn't, um, I had trouble finding a picture actually, but although I know I have them, but off to my right is looking west and uh, there's sort of chocolate colored stripes that are popular uh, morning shots. So um, that's, um, you know, this will get, this will typically get a pretty good crowd in the morning. Uh, also, right near here is 20 Mule Team Canyon, and there are some nice images that can be had inside there. Um, Badwater Basin, uh, again, a classic spot in the uh, park. 
uh, can be shot anytime, you know, mornings and might be your best bet, but I would say jump ball between uh, mornings and uh, uh, late afternoons. Uh, you know, the, the holy grail is this thing will flood in the winter if they get rain. So you might get water. And that can make uh, quite uh, dramatic uh, pictures. Um, so I'm sorry, I couldn't stop myself. So this is a bad water basin in the blue hour. This is an evening shot, again, looking at uh, telescope peak in the winter. And it was completely dark. I was starting to pack up. And then, you know, one of these things where the sky abruptly got uh, a bunch of red in it. And, um, you know, I got uh, some nice uh, looks. And I couldn't stop myself in composi compositionally. So if you're out here shooting and you've got a big, you know, foreground object that you want to anchor your composition on in the front, uh, don't cut your polygons in half. You know, look at these things carefully and pick one where you've got a whole polygon, whole polygon in the picture. But basically, the Van Water Basin is a bunch of these salt polygons that stretch out for miles in every direction. And again, if uh, you are there at the right time, uh, it will be flooded, and you will get a picture like this. So this is from the 2011 uh, club picture. And um, Mike Sugar, who's on the phone, he will maybe recall when Nancy Lear uh, wandered off a path and abruptly sank up to her knee in uh, sticky mud uh, while we were photographing this. Uh, and I think somebody actually had to help pull her out. Uh, the thing that it was so deep. Anyway, uh, this is the uh, Badwater Basin looking north uh, when it happened to be flooded uh, in January of 2011. Uh, so other places starting to wrap up. Any questions so far? Yes, Pete. Yeah. <laughs> for, for wait, for somebody, the, uh, somebody other than Lily, ask a question. Uh, yes. No, go ahead, go ahead Lily. <laughs> yeah, I take everybody's spot. Yeah. You know, the I love saltwater basin. Um, it's very hard to find those very defined and very kind of tall pol polygon. Yeah. From your experience, when you walk towards to the telescope peak, do you make left turn or right turn, get more chance? Well, I think, Lily, let me go back and look at this. Yeah, right. I, I, I think I'm aimed uh, due east on this. Excuse me, due west. Uh, uh, do I, right. I mean, it's the east face of Telescope Peak, and I aim due west. And right. yeah, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, in this image, I can see lots of polygons. So, yeah. uh, you know, you may have had a year where it hadn't had water in it very recently, and they were not so defined. Uh, but um, I, I'd say most of the time they're out there and you, know, you just got to dig them out. And, and then like you said here, probably is a morning shot because you got there around sunset, they all are in the dark, I mean, in the shade already. So you don't get the nice color of the that, sunset because- The reason people like this as a morning shot is because you'll get illumination on telescope peak. Oh, that's uh, the reason. We're, again, we're looking at the mm -hmm. east face of uh, Telescope Peak. So as the sun, I, you know, rises be behind you, uh, it would get a uh, nice color on the mountains. You know, as you point out, this is evening, so it's all shaded. Do you think this possible be a Milky Way shot location or kind of hard? Well, you know, I guess in October, the Milky Way would be off in the west. So... Uh, maybe you could do that. Yeah, Thanks. I don't, I don't, I don't think you would have too much light pollution there in this direction. Yeah, I have have to do light painting on this. Yeah, that would be the thing, Lily. You know, unless you've got a moon out, and I'm just, I'm just trying to think this through with you. I'm, I'm not sure how you could get illumination because if the moon were behind you, that would mean it's rising and you know. Mm -hmm. The winter, the uh, the Milky Way might not be over there yet. So, or excuse me, in the fall. So I don't know. I, I have to think about that. That could really be done. But you know, if you don't have again, this area is so. I mean, I'm a couple of miles from that peak. You know, bird, like bird miles. So, uh, if you don't have the area is so large that if you don't have the moon illuminating, it would just be, uh, you know, a black blob, or you know, you'd have to. Maybe you could maybe stack your photos and coach, coach, uh, coax uh, something out of them, but they, it might not be an ideal sort of shot. 
you know, or you could, uh, you know, just set up your camera and shoot it in the blue hour and then wait for the Milky Way to come up and shoot again and then composite it. So, I mean, there's a couple of things you could do. Right. Okay, other questions? Okay. Uh, so other places, uh, the charcoal kilns are kind of cool. Uh, it's a little remote, although there is a campground near there that gets pretty good use. These are on the way up to the Telescope Peak Trailhead. And it's just one of these, you know, WTF moments. You go around a bend and there's, um, I'll have to count them when I show you the picture, but there's uh, uh, seven or eight or nine of these really well-preserved uh, charcoal kilns, which can make for a nice soil. They're kind of in a can north-south canyon. So again, uh, they probably don't ever get good light. And uh, I shot them at night. Um, Artist Palette is, I think, a somewhat underrated spot. And in the afternoon, Artist Palette is on a west face. And in the afternoon, when it gets good light, uh, there's probably some decent pictures that can be extracted there. It's, um, I think, geologically, what's happened there is it's sort of the center of an old volcano. And, it's an area a couple hundred yards long and high of very uh, colorful rocks. There's greens and yellows and reds in there. So it's, again, a popular destination. So uh, let's see. Um, uh, Artist's palette is down around here where it says Devil's Golf Course. And uh, um, sorry, what was the other place I mentioned? Oh, the charcoal kilns. So the charcoal kilns are a little more of an expedition. Uh, they are right here on the west side of the park. And the road after them on the way up to Telescope Peak can be a real challenge, but it is dirt. And I think you're in pretty good shape by getting as far as the charcoal kilns because there is a campground right about here that gets a lot of use. So I think the Park Service keeps it pretty well maintained. Um, let's see. So these are the charcoal kilns. So let's see, I guess there's, uh, I guess there's nine of them. So again, shot at nighttime and uh, I um, uh, spent $30 on small LED lamps and wrapped them in red cellophane and put them in the entrances. And then I took this picture and then uh, some guy came along right after me and I just said, uh, I need two of these, but uh, I'll just leave the rest of them there for you. So. He wound up with all my cheap LED lights. Um, anyway, you can go out there and you know just have some fun. And this is um, this was picked specifically on a night where I would have uh, um, a setting moon behind me. So I'm looking roughly east or northeast here. So there's a moon behind me that provides all of the illumination. And um, then this is artist palette. Oh, I, this is a this is I think eight eight vertical images uh, stitched together of the Milky Way arch. And the uh, artist's palette itself, I, I did not get quite what I was hoping for here because I really wanted the core of the Milky Way right over the artist's palette rocks. And it was further south. But normally, if you just want artist's palette itself, there's a part you can drive up to it. There's a parking area. You can uh, try and find interesting things to shoot in these, this batch of colorful rocks. Um, but anyway, Artist Palette is here. And again, it's another well maintained, it's paved roads and another well maintained and marked uh, spot in the park to go uh, either sightsee or take pictures. So I think uh, that's the end. And